Stay hungry, stay foolish. Today's guest in this bonus episode is an innovator in his field, a brain specialist and best-selling author who is at the forefront of a new movement within medicine and related disciplines. It's a great pleasure to welcome back to the show, Dr. Daniel Amen. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Aidan. Joy to be with you today. It's great to have you back. Your last episode has been one of our highest listened to episodes of all time, which is both a good thing and a bad thing because it was focused on your latest best-selling book, The End of Mental Illness. But I thought I'd welcome you back onto the show today, particularly to talk about how to manage stress and how to manage negative thinking, and indeed, how we can embrace this challenge for post-traumatic growth in this period of pandemic of the COVID crisis. So firstly, I'd love if you'd share how in moments of stress and crisis, we are literally less intelligent because of how inefficient our brains are. So exposure to stress hormones actually can damage an area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is the major memory and mood center in the brain. I've done studies that showed negative thinking patterns actually drop the function in the front part of the brain. And so our decision making is not going to be as good when we are afraid. The images that go along with a global pandemic are horrifying. And unless we really engage in mental discipline and mental hygiene, we're just not likely to make the right decisions. So we'll come back to some of those solutions because the, the Almond Clinics is packed full of these solutions, including supplementation on which we can take to improve our mental states. But one of the things you talk about, and we talked about at length on the last show, but I'd love to share in the context of the pandemic, is what you call ants, automatic negative thoughts. Yes, they infest us, especially during a pandemic. I coined the term, goodness, almost 30 years ago, after I'd had a really hard day and saw four suicidal patients and two couples who hated each other and two teenagers who ran away from home. And then I came home that night to an ant infestation in my kitchen. And as I was cleaning them up, I'm always playing with letters and words. I'm like, my patients are infested with ants, automatic negative thoughts, the thoughts that come into your mind automatically and ruin your day. And so teaching them mental hygiene, if you will, teaching them how to kill the ants, the automatic negative thoughts, has been shown actually in large studies to be as effective as antidepressant medication. The exercise I teach my patients is whenever they feel sad or mad or nervous or out of control, write down what you're thinking. And then just ask yourself if it's true, if you really know that it's true. So an example during the pandemic is both my mother, my father, and my sister got COVID-19. And my mom and dad are 88 and 90, and they ended up in the hospital with pneumonia in the same room. And my mom's had pneumonia 10 times. My dad um, had just got out of the hospital for a bleed, and he has a heart condition. So they are in the highest risk group of death from COVID-19. And so when they went in and I couldn't visit them, uh, you know, my thought was they're going to die. And that made me incredibly sad. But But I've been teaching my patients for decades how to just not believe every stupid thing they think. And so I wrote it down. They're going to die. And then I went, well, is that true? And if you actually know the statistics, they had a 10 to 27 percent chance of dying. Well, I have spent the last four decades of my life teaching people to reframe situations. Well, what that <laughs> meant is they had a 73 to 90 percent chance of walking out of the hospital, which they did five days later. 
Now, I know that doesn't happen for everybody, but I didn't have to believe it. I just needed to stay present and in the fight because, you know, I was their medical decision maker and it worked out really well. Now they're actually COVID-19 celebrities. They've been, (laughs) you know, their story's been in the Los Angeles Times and CNN and all sorts of places. Um, But I just want people to discipline their minds. And I don't know, Aiden, about you, but when I was a teenager, I was really good at talking back to my parents. And (laughs) it's funny, nobody ever taught me to talk back to myself, that you don't have to believe every stupid thing you think, that questioning your thoughts helps you discipline your mind. Yeah, it's so important. And it's one of the reasons I, I really wanted you on the show. And congratulations on your parents, by the way. It's fantastic news. But one of the reasons I really wanted to reach out to you was in this moment, it's like a pivotal moment in the world anyway. And and your latest book, The End of Mental Illness, is recognizes that there's a pandemic of mental health upon us anyway. But this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis, will only accelerate that. And what I'm very concerned about is how we react as parents, as business owners, as industries, and as a world in general, will actually impact decades to come, generations to come, our children, their children, etc. Because every new experience that we have shapes our thinking and our worldviews. And we're at this pivotal moment that I don't know how it's going to end up, but I'd love to influence people who listen to this show, at least, to have a different worldview going forward. This pandemic is going to, I mean, we were already at epidemic levels of deaths from drugs, alcohol, and suicide. And this is going to make it worse when people lose their jobs, lose their businesses, when they're socially isolated when the news, which has already got a negative bent because it drives more views and more clicks because the brain is wired for negativity. And, you know, thousands of years before that protected us. Well, now it's not protecting us, it's hurting us. And we just need a new way of thinking about brain health and mental health And in the end of mental illness, I argue that I hate the term mental illness. It's shaming, it's stigmatizing, and it's wrong. These are brain health issues that steal people's minds. And what we discovered is get your brain right and your mind will follow. So in a pandemic, eating right, exercising, supplementation, sleeping, not engaging in habits that damage your brain is going to help lessen the incidence of anxiety, depression. So, for example, when the pandemic first hit in my house, I have a 16-year-old daughter, and then we adopted our 15- and 10-year-old nieces. And my daughter just gotten her license, her driver's license. She had just gotten a job. She has a boyfriend, and all of a sudden, we're telling her, you can't go out. And so she felt like she was being punished. And I could see she started actually to get depressed. She knows about good habits. And so really putting them in multiple vitamin, fish oil, saffron is a wonderful supplement that has antidepressant effects, meditation. We have a sauna at home. Saunas, most people don't know, have actually been shown to be a treatment for depression. And we're now, what, five, six weeks into this, and she's no longer depressed um, because we're balancing her brain. And as we balance her brain, her mood is better. And quite frankly, she's just been a joy through this whole thing. And she's become masterful at cooking healthy food. We just have to change this whole paradigm because I'm certain the incidence of anti-anxiety drugs, antidepressants has skyrocketed. But that's not the right 
solution. I mean, it's a solution for some people after they've tried natural ways to strengthen their brain. Some of us are lucky that we had honed those habits before this fell upon us. But for those who haven't, there's a huge amount of articles and resources on the Amman Clinic's website. And one of the articles you recently talked about was how to overcome stress eating because I want people who are listening who are stress eating, for example, or who are not exercising because they're feeling fearful to understand that that's only making things worse. And if we can forgive ourselves for that and understand that that's totally natural, that's the first step. But then we can take steps to remedy that. And I'd love if you'd share them with our audience, Daniel. Well, and the problem with stress eating, especially sugar and foods that quickly turn to sugar. I mean, if you're stress eating vegetables, I'm totally okay with that. There's actually a linear correlation between the number of fruits and vegetables you eat a day and your level of happiness, up to eight. So if you have eight servings of fruits and vegetables, you're happier than if you have six. If you have six, you're happier than if you have four. If you're four, you're happier than if you have two. And um, But sugar and foods that turn to sugar increase inflammation. And people beginning to hear about the cytokine storm caused by COVID-19, which is basically an inflammatory storm. And those conditions that increase inflammation in our body, like gum disease, like sugar, like diabetes or obesity, they make us more vulnerable to die from this thing. And so your best defense against the pandemic is your immune system. And whatever you eat today is strengthening your immune system or it's damaging your immune system. And so colorful fruits and vegetables are just critical. And if you can't get those, uh, then supplementation can just be so helpful. Um, multiple vitamin fish oil, brand new study out just last night on vitamin D um, that we normally get from the sun. But think of what everybody's doing. They're sheltering in place, which means they're not getting great sun. And as vitamin D levels go low, death from COVID-19 go up. And so I recommend to all of my patients that they know their vitamin D level. Now, not everybody's going running out to a laboratory now, but at least taking somewhere between two to 5,000 units of vitamin D a day tends to be protective to our immune system. And another thing you did with Amman Clinics is you studied 160,000 brain SPECT scans, right? Which is just unbelievable, which has told, has informed so much of your studies, of your practices, of your supplementation that's available on the website. And it's clear to you and your team that not all brains react the same to a pandemic like this. And you discovered that there's different types of brains, because I thought it'd be interesting to share this so we can understand why, for example, our neighbors having a party while we're in lockdown and we're obeying the rules and they're not, et cetera, et cetera, because oftentimes it can lead to condemning others. But by understanding them, we cause less stress to ourselves. Well, everybody's brain is different. And uh, if people go to brain healthassessment.com, they can actually take a free test and know about their own brain type. And the spontaneous group, um, I think of them as the don't worry, be happy people, that in the middle of a pandemic, you might find them protesting, you might find them at the beach on a sunny day. They are just less concerned about bad things happening as opposed to the persistent group, they're worried and they're unhappy with the protesters and the people at the beach because they're worried they're going to spread the virus. And so one group has a sleepy prefrontal cortex, the front part of their brain, 
the other group has a busy prefrontal cortex. And often the problem is, is when they're married to each other. <laughs> they end up fighting a lot because their brains are not well matched, if you will. Now, it's very important to have a little bit of anxiety. The don't worry, be happy people, more of the spontaneous group, die the earliest from accidents and preventable illnesses. The cautious type actually lives the longest. They're what we call the conscientious group. When they say they're going to show up, they show up five minutes early, consistently, reliably, predictably, and they live longer than everyone else. But they also have more anxiety. So you just have to sort of know how you're wired and there are ways to balance, lower the anxiety. Or if you need, I never thought I'd have to do that when I first signed up to be a psychiatrist. But I have to actually increase anxiety in a lot of people's just so they do the right things. <laughs> and it's so helpful because, you, again, you have articles on how to get on as a couple in a pandemic when you're locked in the same house together. And again, understanding brain types increases our tolerance of one another. The last thing I'd love to ask you is that thing about children. So our children, you mentioned your daughter, but instilling a positive mindset, yes, that they need to be wary, but how do we increase positive mindsets for them going forward? Because so many of your clients way before this pandemic hit us were children and you're seeing an increase in this, which is a huge tragedy in our society. And it's something that I'd love even for our audience, that if we can instill different mindsets in our children, we can make a little difference. So the most important thing to do is model it because children do what you do, not what you tell them to do. And I often think of children like violins in that they play the stress of their parents. And so the number one strategy to raising brain healthy children is to model those strategies. The second one is to know what you want for them. What kind of parent do you want to be? And what kind of child do you want to raise? Write it down. And then before you say anything to a child or do anything with a child, you just ask yourself, is my behavior getting me what I want? The third thing, I wrote a piece once on how to make your child a Republican, a Democrat, or anything you want. And what I realized is if you're bonded with your child, they will pick your values. And if you're not bonded with your child, if they don't like you, they're going to pick the opposite values just to irritate you. And so bonding requires two things time, actual physical time. And this pandemic has given parents and children more time than at any time in my lifetime. So they have time. And the second thing is a willingness to listen. If your child says something and you immediately start talking over them, stop that. Because what that does is it shuts down communication. It is very important to be a good listener. It's something I call active listening, where they say something and you basically repeat back what you hear and allow them to solve their own problems. And, you know, it's what they teach therapists to do, but they should teach all of us to do it. Better communication will help parents bond better with each other and with their children. Where can people find out more about you, your work, your books, etc.? So they can go to amenclinics.com, amen like the last word in a prayer, clinics.com. They can also go to Amazon and get The End of Mental Illness or Feel Better Fast, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, Memory Rescue. And I have two kids' books I love. One is called Captain Snout and the Superpower Questions, Teaching Kids to Kill the Ants. And another one I love called Time for Bed, Sleepy Head, which is a hypnotic bedtime story and a great bonding exercise for parents and children. Friend of the show, change maker, 
and author of The End of Mental Illness and a, a host of other books, Dr. Daniel Amen. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Aidan.